Well, hello there, Crypto Wisers. It's your good friend Milton here with another video for you. Today, I want to talk about crypto tokenomics. Okay, a lot of people ask me, Milton, what do you look for in crypto tokenomics? What are the questions that you ask before you make your investment decision? So today, I am going to tell you that in detail. We're going to go in detail through all the various questions you want to ask yourself about crypto tokenomics before you put your hard earned money to work investing in crypto. It is really a very important part of crypto investing. And I'm going to distill down for you exactly the questions that I ask, the numbers that I look at and how I analyze them. But before I do that, of course, do me a favor, smash the like button on this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you're new to CryptoWise, if you're just stumbling upon us right now for the very first time, then make sure you check out some of my recent videos. I'd say for the most part, what I like to do is really analyze specific crypto projects or ecosystems within the videos. And I've been doing a lot of videos on SWE recently. I did a SWE DeFi video. I did a sweet gaming video. So definitely make sure that you check those out. And of course, follow us over on Twitter at Crypto Wise Guys. Now, new altcoin alert, guys. I have actually added a new altcoin to my bags, my DGEN portfolio. So this is my high risk portfolio. This is the first project that I bought in a very long time in a private sale. It had been a couple of years before I had done any private sale. I, you know, I'd been offered a ton of different projects to buy in that time, decided not to. I know a lot of people go crazy about the private sales and they want to know how do I get into the private sale or whatnot. A lot of the time, honestly, it's as good or better to just buy the project once it launches because you have no vesting schedule and you have complete freedom of when to go in and out of the token. So that's what I've been mostly doing with altcoins that I like. But I made an exception for XSwap, which just had its TGE. This is a cross chain DEX that is being built with the Chainlink technology. I think Chainlink is going to be huge, especially in this bull run. So having the very first cross-chain decks being built on Chainlink, and there's a lot of great influencers that are involved in this too. So that always helps to have really good marketing for these projects. So anyway, I'm really bullish on XSwap, really excited that it's now out into the world. And if we have a quick look at it here, this is what I'm talking about in terms of you know, private sales not being all that. XSwap came out on May 6th. Basically, every token needs to find its price after it comes out. It's sitting right now just under 12 cents, which is a really great price on a project like this and really not that much more expensive than if you had done the private sale. And and I was in the private sale and, and you know, I have a small amount of my tokens, which I'm just holding, but it's the rest of my tokens are vested, so I won't get them for a while. So again, it's one of those things where if I had waited, probably better for me to just buy in right now at 11 cents. This is one of those things for me that I think it was really just the timing of when it came out. I mean, it's really the luck of the draw for a lot of these projects. Is the market really hot when you're launching? If it is, then, you know, you could see a really big pump on the launch of, of something like an XSwap. If the market's down like it was when XSwap launched, then, you know, it's done fine, but it definitely didn't have the pump that it could have had considering how strong a project this is. All right, guys, that takes me to my main topic of today, analyzing crypto tokenomics. So, so important. So if you're brand new to crypto, uh, I just want to just go over. So if you, you know, probably one of the first websites that you visit will be something like CoinMarketCap or CoinGecko. And they have all these numbers, you know, all these tokenomic numbers on the side here and all the numbers that create the charts. And sometimes this can be intimidating if you don't know what you're, what to look for or what these numbers mean. But even if you are a sophisticated crypto degen like myself, it's always good to go back to the basics, reevaluate your strategy for investing in these tokens. And so making this video has done that for me. It's allowed me to really think about, okay, 
what do I look for in tokenomics, in crypto tokenomics? And how do I weight that when I'm making my decision to either invest or not invest in a token? And I'm going to be talking about that in today's video because it's an important topic. At the end of the day, there are so many variables that go into my decision of whether to invest or not. Tokenomics is just one of those things that I like to look at. I like to do the research, but ultimately my decision might surprise you in the end. I've invested in a bunch of things that on the surface had bad tokenomics, but in the end were great investments and vice versa, invested in things because I thought the tokenomics were just can't fail and yet they did fail. So keep that in mind and I want to talk more about that. So I'm going to go through with you right now all the questions that I ask, all the numbers that I look at in general, talk about what they are, and then I'll look at some specific cases, talk about some of the major L1s in crypto and look at their tokenomics and just go through a couple of examples for you and just talk about the different touch points of the tokenomics so that you have a very clear idea of what I do. And of course, guys, don't leave me hanging in today's video. Comment. Let me know. What did I miss? Are there numbers in tokenomics that you look at that I didn't talk about? I really want this channel to be a conversation for all of us about crypto so that we can learn together, grow together, and make as much money as possible together. So don't forget to comment in today's video and let me know what are your ideas on tokenomics? How do you use crypto tokenomic analysis to make your decisions? Okay, so let's start going through this. Tokenomics, how does Milton analyze his crypto tokenomics? Well, first thing I look at, the total supply of the tokens. What is the total supply? The total supply is the maximum number of tokens that will ever exist. So once every token is out there, how many actually will ever exist? This affects the scarcity, obviously, and the potential value of the tokens. So classic Bitcoin, everyone knows that Bitcoin will only ever have 21 million Bitcoin. That is the maximum total supply of Bitcoin. Now, there are a lot of crypto out there that you don't know the total supply because it has an inflation built into it. And so the total supply is actually infinity because in theory, it could keep adding to that total supply. So obviously that would be a mark against the tokenomics for said project, unless they had a really strong case for why they decided to go that route. And I'll be talking about a crypto that does exactly that later in today's video. But first, when I look at total supply, okay, how many of these tokens are potentially going to be out there when it is all said and done? Second, circulating supply, the number of tokens currently available and in circulation. This is a very important number to know. So out of that total supply, how many have already been created? and are out into the world right now. All right, those ones are pretty straightforward. Let's look at the next one, market cap. So what is the market cap? This is always talked about in crypto. Market cap this, market cap that. So the market cap is calculated as the circulating supply multiplied by the current price of the token. So you take the price of the token, you multiply that by the circulating supply, that's your market cap. So that provides you a snapshot of the project's current valuation. So if we go on to coin market cap here, this is how basically the chart is organized. Usually it defaults by being organized by the market cap. So that is why Bitcoin is always number one. It has by far the highest market cap. That is the circulating supply of Bitcoin right now multiplied by the price of Bitcoin. But there's a second number that is almost as important, if not more important. Some people think it's actually more important. That is the fully diluted market cap. So that's where you take the total value of the cryptocurrency at its current price if all future tokens were issued and in circulation today. So going back to that total supply, if you take that total supply and multiply it by today's price, what would that make the market cap? And that is what we refer to as the fully diluted market cap. And this is important. I always like to look at that fully diluted market cap. A lot of you listening right now or watching, we're probably going, yeah, 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 Milton, come on, we know that. That's like crypto 101, tokenomics 101. And I agree, 
tokenomics 101 but important to talk about for people who don't know that yet what happens is a lot of people come into crypto and when they're new they just look at the price of the token and even psychologically because i've talked to a lot of teams about this who create their tokenomics and they'll just psychologically say you know that the price of the token they find can really affect whether retail buys it or not and they don't even look at the market cap and they definitely don't look at the fully diluted market cap. They're just looking at the price, you know, like even Bitcoin, 60 something thousand. It's too expensive. So sometimes that will happen. And then they'll look at something that's a dollar and they'll think, oh, it's only a dollar. Like a definitely 100x from here. But you got to look at the market cap. You got to look at the fully diluted market cap. You got to look at the tokenomics. And that's why we're going through this. So I agree. That is the baseline. Those are the basics. From there, you got to start digging and doing a little bit more research. So there's token allocation. So the token allocation is the breakdown of how tokens are distributed among the team, the investors, the advisors, the community. So this will indicate to you the potential for market dilution and the incentives of different stakeholders. So of course, how much of the token is the team getting? That's always a big one. But then you also wanna know, well, how much of the token is going to actually growing the ecosystem or incentivizing developers to build on it or investors to invest in it. And then those early investors, those private investors, you know, what did they get in at? How many of the tokens are going to them? And then once you know the allocation, you want to know the token release schedule. Let's say the team is getting 10% of the token. That's kind of standard. But if they're getting 10% kind of on day one, and they can sell that at any time, that's much different than if they don't get that 10% until two years down the road or three or four or a little bit at a time. So the release schedule is the detailed information about how and when the remaining tokens not yet in circulation will be released. And this is crucial as it can significantly impact the token price if large quantities of tokens enter the market suddenly. I'm actually going to show a example later in today's video about a token that actually had a very major unlock recently and actually the price did not move at all which was honestly surprising. All right, from there, I look at the inflation rate, the rate at which the new tokens are minted and how it compares to the rate at which tokens might be burned or removed from circulation. Some tokens have very high inflation rates. Some tokens have very low inflation rates. So I pair that with deflationary features. So any features that decrease the total supply over time, like token burns that occur with specific triggers or actions within the ecosystem. Next, I look at utility and use cases. So specific functions and utilities of the token. And this has been an argument forever in crypto is does this project actually need a token? What is the utility of the token? Certain projects have amazing utility. Other projects have terrible utility. That is a big one. Definitely, definitely tend to lean towards projects that have more utility for their token. But we've definitely seen huge success stories with projects that have zero utility. Next, I look at transaction fees, fees associated with buying, selling, or transferring tokens and how these fees are used. So classic example would be Ethereum, obviously, used as the gas fee. The ETH token is used for the gas fee of Ethereum. And this is very common for L1s, L0s, L2s. So transaction fees, that is a use case or utility, but for me, it's a very specific one. And I look like to look into the um, specific numbers around transaction fees. Next, I look at staking rewards. So if it's a proof of stake project, details about the returns provided to token holders for staking or locking up the token, the token unlock uh, period, for staking, anything to do with staking of the token. Next, I look at governance rights. So a lot of tokens, one of the main utilities will be it is a governance token, which allows you as a token holder to vote on the future of the project. So if that is the case, I like to look into that. Next, I look at the funding and treasury management. Most projects will have a treasury that has a bunch of their token. So you want to know how is that managed? What are the decisions that they make? What can it be spent on? Certain treasuries will have very specific rules. This can be only spent on this or this or this. Other treasuries don't have any rules and maybe can just be voted on by the governing body. Or maybe some treasuries are just centralized and the team gets to decide. So that's very important to know if there's a large amount of the tokens in the treasury. Well, how is that being managed? Next, participation incentives. These, I think, are really important. So any rewards that incentivize users to participate in the ecosystem. Then lastly, I like to look at the liquidity 
and the volume of the token. This is very important because you want to be in tokens that are liquid, meaning you can get in and out of them easily. If you need that money, can you get out right now? If you had to sell your tokens right now, could you do it? And could you do it without moving the price too much? That's very important. So liquidity, and I like to look at the 24-hour trading volume. That gives me a sense of, yes, there is activity. There is something going on in this token. So that gives you a breakdown of what I look at. Those are the questions I ask. Those are the numbers I look at. All right, so why don't we have a look at some examples here? First off, I thought we would look at our old friend Solana. Obviously, in my opinion, and of course many others, I think Solana is is a must own these days. It just, in terms of network effect, it's just really doing much better than any other ETH competitors. You've got TVL like crazy. You've got transactions, wallets, everything. It's kind of outdoing even Ethereum these days. So must own. So anyway, let's use this as our first example and go through looking and analyzing the tokenomics of Solana. So first off, we want to see what the total supply of Solana is. And we can see here from CoinMarketCap, the CoinMarketCap is going to have a lot of the information that you need. You could use CoinGecko as well. So total supply of Solana, they are projecting to be 500 and 75 million. But as you can see, max supply here is infinity because there will always be some kind of inflation built into Solana. So we don't actually know what the max supply will. So this is one of those cases where we don't actually know what the max supply of Solana will be. But in these cases, even though the actual number is infinity, you can just go with what the total supply is. That is a good approximation. After that total supply, you're looking at a very minimal increase probably as the inflation over the years will decrease. So then you want to look at the circulating supply. So how many tokens are actually in circulation right now? And with Solana, you have almost 450 million. So you have a, a large chunk of the total supply is actually in circulation. And that would be a plus, obviously. So when you're looking at these numbers, one of the things to, to think about is if there's only a very small circulating supply out there probably means that there's going to be a lot of token unlocks and increase in circulating supply in a short time period which could affect price so obviously more information the better and in in this case with solana you've got a good chunk of the circulating supply out there so Really, it's just the inflationary, the built-in inflation in terms of new tokens being added to the system. So if you look at the existing market cap then, right now Solana is just under $66 billion, and the fully diluted market cap is at just under $85 billion. So there's not that much of a difference actually in terms of the market cap, the existing market cap right now, the current market cap versus what the fully diluted market cap could be. All right, so those are the main basic numbers that you always want to look at, and they're all right here for you on CoinMarketCap or CoinGecko or whichever one of these kind of sites that you like to use. All right, so as you remember, after that, we're going to look at token allocation and the token release schedule. So actually coin market cap is also good for this. Uh, if you just scroll down, you'll see that for most tokens, they'll have the allocation there if it is publicly available information. So we can see in this case for Solana, community reserve was 38%. The seed sale was almost 16%, which is pretty high. Founding sale, 13% almost again. So that's a combination of 28, 29%. And the team got 12.5%. So for me, I kind of think of those three numbers all in one because these are people either getting tokens for free or for a uh, very cheap. And so that's the seed sale, founding sale, and the team. And you've got the foundation, 12.5% of the tokens went to the foundation. And in this case for Solana, the foundation is, is just an, it's another entity, but it's pretty much centralized. You've got basically the team gets to decide on what to do with the foundation treasury. Validator sale, you had 5%. Strategic sale, 1.84. And then the public auction sale was only 1.6% of the tokens. So on paper, and honestly, this is what something I looked at when Solana came out. I looked at these tokenomics and I said, well, this is horrible. You know, you've got about 40% of the tokens going seed sale, founding sale, and team. That is a lot of tokens that people are getting for super cheap. And we have seen, obviously, huge uh, repercussions of this 
The biggest one was when FTX fell, uh, went bankrupt, and they owned a shit ton of Solana from the uh, seed sale, private sale, and that really ended up being the biggest crash that we saw on Solana, and it took Solana down under $10 again. Now, thankfully, it has been very, very strong since. So again, Solana is a perfect example of a token overcoming, of a project overcoming actual terrible tokenomics. So I was pretty late to Solana, relatively late for someone who's been in crypto for a long time, in that, you know, I knew about Solana from the very beginning and I had been watching it, but I did not invest in it. And I missed the very first, you know, pump, really because I saw this pump here. I saw it go up to about 45 bucks, started doing research on it, started looking at the tokenomics and thinking, Mm, I do not like these tokenomics. And yet it did not matter. We saw Solana in the last bull run go all the way to $250. And then obviously, I think this is where it caught, got caught up in terms of its bad tokenomics. So many people had made so much money in that seed sale, founding sale team, this and that, that obviously they were still in profits when it was under $10. But as we can see, they've built such a strong network effect that they've been able to overcome that. And now, a couple of years later, the tokenomics really don't matter as much because most of the people who would have wanted to sell those tokens by now would have sold. The only caveat I will say to Solana, and this is something that you want to keep in mind, and this is kind of where you want to do more research or know a little bit more about a project, is that FTX still holds a lot of their private sale tokens that are vested and uh, they don't won't be getting for still a while and they're auctioning those off to people so because of the vesting schedule there are still a lot of new tokens coming into circulation that were bought very cheap in terms of solana so that brings us to token release schedule and so this is where you want to go uh, away from coin market cap i like to use uh, token unlocks so this is a great site here which gives you a ton of information on tokenomics and so let's have a look here at the solana token unlocks page so here here, the emission rate. So you can see there are no more cliff unlocks, which is great. There's just that linear unlock going on, which now is just a small percentage of the overall circulating supply, just 0.12% of the circulating supply. So here it will give you upcoming events. And again, there aren't any big unlocks happening anymore with Solana. That is the good thing about these older projects is a lot of those big unlocks have happened now over the last few years. So now it's just the linear inflation that is happening. And this is where you want to get to here is the big unlock chart. And this really gives you a good indication of what tokens are hitting the market when. So as we can see here, we're here today. Most of all the unlocks have happened. So you see these all these straight lines here. We can see that uh, team tokens have all been paid out. Validator tokens, a founding round, the seed round, the foundation grant pool, community coinless auction. All of that has already been paid out. So the only thing really that is causing more tokens to hit the market is the built-in inflation into Seoul. There's nothing really scary anymore in terms of the Seoul token hitting the market. And so this is going to be a big difference between older tokens and brand new tokens. So the older tokens, for the most part, will have the advantage when it comes to tokenomics now. But we know that in a bull cycle, most of the new money like to go into the newer token. So this is where you're going to have to weigh your decisions in terms of investing. You're going to look at two projects and we'll, we'll compare a new project now to this Solana tokenomics. And you're going to ba basically say that the old project probably has better tokenomics. The new project has tokenomics that I don't really like, but which do I think can do better in this bull cycle? And that's kind of always what you're doing. You're kind of weighing these decisions based on, you know, looking at the facts, looking at the data, but then kind of ultimately for me it comes down to kind of gut instinct taking the experiences that I had in the last bull cycles and trying to create a diversified portfolio that I think can do really well overall. All right, so going back to uh, coin market cap, obviously in terms of utility, right now we're going to be looking at some layer one. So all the utility will involve the gas token for, for the thing, which is to me still the number one utility for any crypto. We know that the foundation uses a lot of their tokens to incentivize developers and, and throw events and do marketing and all that kind of stuff. So because Solana's built such a big network effect, clearly they are 
investing very smartly within that treasury. Whatever they've been doing, it's hard to know exactly because it's a private, basically, entity that's doing it, but clearly it is working. And then from a liquidity standpoint, because we're going to be looking at the bigger tokens, that's not going to be an issue. But when you get to very small tokens, that will be an issue. But CoinMarketCap has the uh, volume, 24 hours, and for Solana, obviously not a problem. Very liquid. You can get in and out of Solana whenever you want, and you're not going to affect the price at all. All right, so that's that's one one example. So now let's look at a another example that is more of a newer token, and we can see how the tokenomics are going to be affected. All right, so let's take my beloved SWE as another example here to go through the tokenomic exercise of, of analyzing the tokenomics and, and seeing what information is there to make an informed decision in terms of investing or not. Here we have SWE. It's actually having a bit of a crazy day today. Went all the way up above 110 earlier, and now it's back down to 105. But as we can see from the kind of basic tokenomics, there is a max supply to SWE. So SWE is taking a different tactic. And I wanted to compare Sol and SWE because I really think that SWE has the potential to be the Solana of this bull run. And they're very similar products, both layer ones that are very, very fast, very, very cheap cheap and really work hard to have a great experience kind of from the user experience. If you haven't used Solana or SWE yet, you're only using Ethereum, you'll notice like how much better just kind of the user experience is on these chains. So they went with a max supply of 10 billion SWE. Now, honestly, look, I don't think it really matters how many tokens there are in, in a project. That's kind of arbitrary because most crypto or all crypto can be divided into very small fractions of a full token. So it really doesn't matter. But what does matter is this idea of a max supply. There will only ever be 10 billion SWE, which is different than Solana, which we looked at that had the total supply but did not have a max supply. So here we have the same total supply and the same max supply of 10 billion. But we can see the circulating supply of SWE is only 2.4-ish billion, which represents about less than 25% of the token is out into the world. So a much smaller circulating supply. And of course, that's a knock against it because that means that there are are many, many more tokens to hit the market, which is going to dilute the share of each of those tokens. So in terms of market cap, SWE right now is the 47th largest uh, crypto out there, 2.5 billion market cap, give or take. And in terms of volume, liquidity, again, this is one of the top tokens, so you're not going to have to worry about that there. The fully diluted market cap in this case then is $10.5 billion. And I want to talk about that fully diluted market cap again just for a second. It's the idea of like, what do you think this project is actually worth? What do you think the potential is from a market cap? So if we go to Solana, back to Solana, its fully diluted market cap, as we saw, was almost $85 billion. Its current market cap is $66 billion. So that gives SWE, if you do think that SWE has the potential to get to where Solana is now, we're not even talking about Solana at the peak of the bull market. We're just talking about where it is now. A lot of people think Solana will at least double from here, if not triple or more. So you've got basically an 8x potential in SWE to get to where Solana is just from a, that is from the fully diluted market cap. But we know that in this cycle, the fully diluted market cap will not be out there. So really you're looking at the market cap that exists right now at 2.5, that's like approximately like a 30x because there's such a limited supply, circulating supply out there of SWE. All right, so now let's look at token unlocks for SWE. And this is where things get really interesting. Recently in SWE, there was a lot of talk about a huge unlock happening, actually around 8% of the total supply of SWE was going to be unlocked. Now, unfortunately, if we look at token unlocks here on the chart, it's actually a bit off in terms of the date because it has that token unlock. We can see here things are going 
smoothly and then all of a sudden this huge jump. So this is the huge unlock that people have been uh, really scared of the last couple of weeks in terms of SWE. Now on the token unlock chart, it says that it's happening in early June. And we can see from this chart here that the early contributors, the Series B and the Series A tokens are beginning their unlock. Now they're all, they are all on a vesting schedule, but a lot of them were going to be getting their first allocation uh, from the private sales and they were going to get, you know, let's say they were getting 15, 20% of whatever they were owed. A lot of people were scared of that, including myself. I mean, that is very scary. That is a huge jump. You don't normally see that, but basically what has happened is SWE was turning one and I guess all these tokens were on a schedule where they didn't receive any tokens for one year and then they were going to get X amount of tokens and then it would be vesting for a while. Anyway, this is a perfect example of an unlock that in theory you would be able to trade around i mean obviously you would think this many new tokens hitting the market is going to affect the price of SWE. so a lot of people sold in advance of this thinking there was going to be a big drop actually the crazy thing is nothing happened if we look at the seven day chart we did see SWE go down it went just under a dollar yesterday but that was really it just coming down with the market like it didn't really do anything extra it's kind of gone down with the market it's kind of come back with the market and then it's going down again with the market. This is with 8% of the token supply hitting the market. So now we know that the token unlocks page isn't exactly correct. I mean, it's pretty close, but it's not exactly correct. What's actually very cool about SWE is they knew that this was going to be a big thing. And so they put out their own page. So with the, their own accurate information about the SWE token supply and circulation. And this is something that I wish other projects would do. I mean, it really should be this transparent. So let's go through this page and see what SWE had to say about their own token supply and circulation. They say SWE mainnet launched publicly on May 3rd, 2023. The network's native token SWE facilitates on-chain transaction, pays gas fees, it secures the network, and provides on-chain liquidity. The SWE token supply is capped and has a long-run circulating supply of 10 billion tokens. At mainnet launch, roughly 5% of all tokens were in circulation, with the remainder being released on a proposed schedule, as shown in the graph below, to maintain network stability. The total supply has been portioned in a manner to support those who contributed to the launch of SWE mainnet and ensure its ongoing health through a vibrant active community. So here is their chart, very similar chart, but we can see from the actual date of this unlock was May 3rd. It was the one year anniversary is when the Series A, the Series B, and the Mistin Lab Treasury started to unlock. Now, I'm definitely not worried about the treasury at all. And you can see it's a tiny fraction here. I wish that treasury were, were actually more. But then they've also got the Community Reserve Fund, which is one of the biggest tranches of the token. And that basically doubled in size in this last unlock. And that's to build out, you know, that's for developers, building community, marketing, all, all, all sorts of things. So they've actually split the treasury in half in terms of they have the treasury and then they have this community reserve, which is essentially a treasury in itself. But really, it's the early contributors, the Series A and Series B. I'm not worried that they're getting tokens, obviously, you know, that's like every other project. But I am shocked that this huge release of tokens that just happened has had no, no effect, negligible effect on the price so far. And I purposely didn't do this video right on the third because I didn't think there would be a huge jump right on the third. But I thought maybe of the course of, of the next week, we would see SWE having a relative weakness compared to the rest of the market. And we just have not seen that. And SWE has gone even further. They they have some resource links here. I definitely recommend you uh, go through them if you're interested in their tokenomics, especially this one here, announcing the Swede tokenomics. This goes through exactly everything. And the one thing about Swede that is an interesting case study is that its inflation for staking, its staking rewards are much lower than Solana's or Polkadot's or a lot of the other uh, kind of competitors out there, which is, is interesting. It's only, it's like between three and 4%. So Anyway, that is the example of SWE, and we can see how that has been different than Solana. If we see the upcoming events, Token Unlocks does have this kind of big event still happening. They have it for the 31st of May. And this is one of those cases where, based on having contradictory information on the SWE website from the Token Unlocks website, you would want to do some more digging because there is the potential that maybe those tokens have not hit the market yet, and 
we'll be seeing that at the end of May. But if we believe the SWE website, and I think it makes more sense that this unlock would have happened one year on their one year anniversary of May 3rd, then we're in the clear for this major unlock. So I'm going to be keeping my eyes out on it. Basically, as you guys know, SWE is going to be one of my biggest bags. It already is. I have accumulated a lot of SWE already and I will. It's the one token that I'm kind of really aggressively accumulating in this uh, bull cycle. And for me, because the market is is kind of sideways and a little bit down these days, there's no rush for me to buy more SWE right now. I'm going to wait out and make sure that these tokens are indeed in the market and see and really want to watch and see, do they have any tangible price effect? All right. One last token I want to have a look at here and i'm not going to compare the full tokenomics is polka dot so basically i wanted to compare my three major chains non-ethereum chains that i'm invested in the one big difference here with polka dot which i don't know is a plus i think it's a plus in the long run but right now it seems to be a negative for me is it's transparency around its treasury spending so if you have not been following polka dot they are way ahead of the curve in terms of decentralization they are by far the most decentralized altcoin out there in my opinion but what they've also done is totally decentralize their treasury so if you go here to poke assembly and click on polka dot you can see exactly basically anyone who wants to get money from the treasury they have to apply here and the community gets to vote. So we can see exactly how the treasury is spending money, which in theory is great. It's also adding a lot of negative attention to Polkadot because there's obviously a lot of infighting on what to spend the money on. You can see all the wasted treasury money. In my opinion, a lot of the marketing, they have been spending a ton of marketing money that to me has been a waste. And you know, anytime marketing money goes out, that it's being spent. So for example here, we've got coin market cap, you know, a proposal to get marketing, a marketing package on coin market cap. Now this is for 138,000 dot, which is almost a million dollars. And it's passing by a wide margin. And one of the things is this, this, their logo turning into the fire. So as we, if we go to the polka dot, if we go to coin market cap, you might've noticed this. If you just scroll down and you find polka dot here, see it turns into the little fire uh, the logo does. So it does make it stand out. I really like this actually. I think this is super cool. But do I want a million dollars of the treasury spent on that and a few other things from coin market cap? I don't know. I mean, this is actually one that I like more than others. I mean, there have been a a ton of dot going to marketing and ones that I don't think are great. Now, to me, this is a downside of DOT right now is the treasury spending because I can see it and I can see the wasted money where something with SWE, I don't see what they're spending it on. So in theory, that's worse. There's something great, obviously, for in crypto to be decentralized, to have your treasury spending totally decentralized. But do I trust a very smart team at SWE that has a clear vision for how to build out the network effect and utilize their treasury smartly that way or trust the community of dot holders? So far, the community of dot holders to me have proven that they aren't trustworthy, that they kind of seem like kids in a candy shop, just willy nilly spending treasury money. And also even worse, that there are a lot of these little cliques now that have happened in dot. And if you're part of that clique, you can basically access the treasury whenever you want. So that has been a main issue for me uh, with Polkadot these days. So in terms of tokenomics, even though some of the other tokenomics of DOT I don't mind so much, it has very high inflation. But if you stake your DOT, you basically get a very high yield for staking, which outweighs the inflation. But it's like being part of a community and you're paying your taxes and you see people wasting your taxes. To me, that's what OpenGov seems like these days is I feel like my DOT, my precious DOT is being inflated away and that money is being wasted on things that I don't agree with. Even though in theory, I 
very much believe in, that all of these projects are going to have to go decentralized with their treasury. Right now, in these early stages, I prefer the Solanas and the Swedes as an investor, not knowing, not seeing where that treasury money is being spent. So some of it gets wasted. I'm not. It's not out in the open for everyone to see that. And I trust the teams to make these decisions way more than I trust the community at this point. When we are still in a very delicate stage of crypto and which projects will survive or not. Now, once the network effect is there, I definitely think that the treasury should be decentralized. But I think we're a few years away from that. And so on Polkadot, that has been a major issue for me in terms of its tokenomics. All right, guys. That was today's video, a in-depth look at how I analyze tokenomics. I'm going to be using this now as I go through and make new videos on new altcoins and things like that. Now you'll have a sense of, of that when I talk about the tokenomics and how I'm analyzing it, we'll all have kind of the same framework. As I said at the beginning of the video, please leave me a comment and let me know how is it different from how you analyze the tokenomics? What numbers are you really zeroing in on to make your investment decisions? And of course, if you enjoyed this content, please smash the like button. Really helps other people discover crypto wise and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And make sure you have those notification bells on because as you know, if you watch the channel, I don't have a set schedule for the videos yet. So make sure that your notifications on so that you are informed every time I drop a new video. All right, guys, as always, thanks so much for watching. I'm Milton. Until next time, over and out.